why you felt that that was something important to write about. So um, the word apologia uh, comes from the Latin, and it was used um, primarily in the 18th century, and it means a defense. And it was used in, um, in the article that I wrote about Michael Cohen and his defense of himself before um, the U.S. Uh, House Committee and some of his actions as, as a Trump um, employee, as Trump's lawyer, and some of the things that he, he did there. And, um, you know, it was interesting. What fascinated me about the Cohen's testimony was the way that he apologized. Because, as you said, people say I'm sorry without really saying I'm sorry. And he, and he sort of owned up to the fact that he'd done some pretty um, terrible things uh, because he wanted to feel important. And he put his family at risk. He may have, depending on how you feel politically, he may have put his country at risk. Um, and and he owned his actions. Now, granted, he's probably going to jail, and you think, well, what else does he have to lose? And some people said, well, he's a, he's a liar, so he's not really sorry. But I don't think whether he lied or didn't lie to the, to the House committee is of as, as much of importance as when you apologize to own everything that to own your actions. And I think that we tend to, to, and I do this, I mean, I'm not just saying other people do this, but we tend to kind of deflect or we try to find excuses for um, why we do things. And I think we need to just put it out there and we need to be honest and we need to say, I made a mistake. And there's no fault in saying, well, unless you're going to jail, but um, there's nothing wrong with saying I made a mistake. I was I'm wrong, and I think more people need to do that. Whether they are testifying before a House committee or if they're in the car with their kids. But in general, isn't that just something that we as society have an issue with? Because it seems to me that whether it's relationships, whether it's even work, we have a tendency to not want to own up to whatever the mistake was and to find ways to either evade it or to duck it or to not uh, not take claim for whatever it is that's going on. It just seems that that's almost a societal issue where we don't want to necessarily take claim of whatever it is, whether it's owning up to the mistakes that you might have made in a relationship or whether it's mistakes that we make in jobs. We all make mistakes in jobs, but I don't know that we necessarily want to own up to them as a general rule. Well, restorative practices, one of the things that I love about restorative practices is that um, not only it holds space, but it asks questions about what were you thinking when you did something or said something. And then when you're speaking to the person that you may have caused harm to, they get to tell you about the impact of your actions. So it's not to make, meant to shame you or to make you feel bad. But it's meant to it's meant so to, for you to understand the impact that your actions and your words have on others and to take responsibility for that. And then sort of the closing part of restorative practices is that you and the other person come together and decide how do we not let this happen in the future? What things need to happen in the future? Um, to prevent this. And a good example is um, Cassidy Friedman, as I said, is my creative collaborator. He's an amazing documentary uh, director. He has a film out right now called Circles about efforts in Oakland, California to keep their restorative justice program. And it's told through the eyes of Eric, who is a man who works for the school system, um, who works with kids at the worst high school um, in Oakland using restorative practices. So anyway, Cassie and I are in Detroit, and we're, we're filming together all day. Um, we're looking at film stills all night. We, um, we share an Airbnb, and we're fighting. We're fighting a lot. Like, we fight every other day. And um, because we weren't able to, we weren't able to see the other person's point of view. And so we were only there for a week and like Sunday night, the night before we were supposed to leave, we had a conversation where I truly understood what his point of view was. And I was able to appreciate it. And he truly understood what my point of view was. 
And I had to own um, my re- my actions and my behavior as well as he. Um, and I think that we're a stronger, better team for, even though we fought a lot, but we are a stronger, better team because we finally understood where the other person was coming from. And we're now able to collaborate from a stronger space than we had before. And how would you do restorative justice to, like, in situations where it's difficult to even address the issue? Because I'm thinking as I'm hearing you that there should probably be cases and point where people should have restorative dialogue with exes. They should have restorative dialogue <laughs> with, mini- with, with ministers that may have hurt them in the past. Because a lot of times we what, the, what we hear in the church and what we actually feel is the true message don't know, always um, – coincide together. So it seems to me that some of these conversations might be some difficult conversations to have, because I don't know that you would necessarily be able to reach out to an ex from four or five years ago or a church person that gave you these kind of like thoughts that you then, as you grew, you changed your views of what they were telling you. I don't know that you could necessarily have those conversations, but it seems to me as I'm hearing you say these things, that they're conversations that should be happening. Yes. Um, And a lot of times people don't want to have those conversations because of shame and because of pain and and because of unprocessed hurt, uh, because they feel like they're going to be attacked. And in those situations, I think it's best if um, you have a third person, a neutral party there, not necessarily as a mediator, um, but somebody, because those conversations can get really heated and they can go off into other areas where um, where you don't want to go. But there's a list of questions, and I, of course I can't remember all of them, but there's a list of questions and you kind of go through the questions in order to stay on topic. Um, for cases of restorative justice, they have formal conferences where they do a lot of pre work before they even get in that room and get in that circle and there's and there's certain rituals that have to happen before And now for our feature presentation. Ladies and gentlemen, may I have your attention please? These conversations need to happen because we have so many broken relationships and and I'm speaking from the heart and I'm speaking from personal experience and rather than repair them, we just kind of keep limping along. And the other thing that I know is that some of the work that you're talking about also happens with what we call, or some of the society calls, troubled youth and things of that nature. But I don't even like those terms. I mean, my brother actually works with what they call at-risk youth. But I don't like at-risk youth. I don't like troubled youth. Because it seems to me that a lot of times we're already shading the conversation by the terminology that we use. So if you're calling the kid at-risk, then you're already putting him in a box. And the same with even troubled youth. That's an even more troubling word than I know. I just used troubled a couple of times in that sentence. But that's an even more complex one that seems to me that creates issues. So I imagine that some of the restorative justice conversation is also about how we phrase the dialogue. Yes, and Henry McClendon, who, oh my goodness, is my hero, but he was really the one in Detroit who who started these efforts. It's been his vision um, to, to, to have Detroit as a restorative city, and Henry is a pastor, he's a community leader, he's the Michigan State Representative for the International Institute for Restorative Practices, and he's just like, he's just an angel. And um, I asked him in an interview uh, for the documentary whether he, um, you know, whether he actually got angry at anybody because he's so sweet and he's so patient. And he said, no, I don't get angry with people. I don't have enemies. It's just somebody's story I haven't heard yet. So when you think about those words, troubled youth or at-risk youth, they're not troubled or at risk. We just don't know what their stories are. And I think as adults, it's our responsibility to dig deep for those stories and to see if there's, no, if there's something we can do as a community to address them. Because that's one of the things, and I mentioned earlier because it's going on this weekend, and I'm sure you've attended it in the past, that's one of the things that I actually enjoy about 
documentarians is that a lot of times these stories that should be told, we don't hear about them until they get made into a documentary. I know you're working on the documentary about restorative justice and, of course, full friends going on now, so there's going to be a lot of these kind of conversations that go on because a lot of times even the discussions around what the documentary topic is, we don't even address until the documentary comes out about it. I mean, I wonder how many people are actually having serious conversations about race relations and even race relations in the um, year 2019 because of Best of Enemies. Yeah, yeah. Well, um, Circles, the documentary that Cassidy, uh, my creative collaborator, did, um, he and Eric actually go out into the communities and do the screenings. And so this past weekend, they were in Iowa, and they did the screening of Circles, and then they had – um, they brought Eric out, and he talked about his work, and the audience was mostly white, and Eric is a black man from Louisiana, so, um, and then I think Cassidy and Cassidy's wife and Eric and I think Cassidy's dad also do a regular race relations circle in Oakland, so discussions are being had. We just need to have more of them. I'm not sure if I'm the best person to do the race relations uh, circle because I really get in my feelings when we talk about race relations. I'm not able to be calm, but I think but they are happening around around the country. Yeah, because I noticed that one of your uh even one of your columns, I've noticed that you don't always get calm because of one of your columns you were dealing with even the way that uh for lack of a better term, certain segments of America are painting the picture of our society through the film world. So I did see that on one of your uh columns on your page where you explain some of what that um, has looked like in your mind. Yes, and and um, I think I was writing about A Wrinkle in Time. Are we referring to that? That's the one I'm referring year. to, yes. yes. Yeah, A Wrinkle in Time. And, and watching A Wrinkle in Time was, to me, a, a political act. And it was, and I know a lot of people didn't like the movie, and it got panned. And it was really hard. First of all, Ava DuVernay did a yeoman's job trying to get that the, the book into a film adaptation um, because that's not the easiest book to render into a movie. And I think she did the best she could with the material that she had. Some books should just stay books. Um, that being said, um, it was great that she casted a, multi, a biracial girl as the lead actress because that opened up some possibilities in the dialogue. And in the story itself, we have this girl who kind of, um, basically, she's into math and science. She's kind of a nerd. She discovers this this way of like rescuing her dad, who's somehow lost. So, it's a long story. See the movie or read the book. But um, but it, it seemed like a political act because you had for the first time a biracial girl being cast in the lead role of this kind of I won't call it a Harry Potter movie, but in that genre of film, and that was just really interesting to watch. And it seems that Ava, I mean, people have said this about Spike as well, but definitely Ava, it seems like that's just her modus operandi. I mean, I don't know how you can watch 13, which is basically an indictment of the prison system without uh, having an opinion one way or the other, because it just seems like a lot of her movies are that way, where she is one of those movie makers that isn't afraid to tackle issues and give a very hard assessment of whatever that issue is, whether it's, like I said, 13 was definitely about the prison system and how the prison system to some degree came out of slavery, actually to a lot of degrees. My favorite directors are directors like Ava DuVernay, Spike Lee. I'm totally in love with Alfonso Cuaron. Um, these filmmakers who have a definite point of view and they're not afraid to express it. And it, and they express it not only in the content that they choose to, to film, but also in the way that they choose to film and the choices that they make. Uh, one of the reasons why I'm so in love with Alfonso Cuaron, I keep calling him my future husband, I'm hoping that if I speak it into existence, it'll happen, is that he basically won an Oscar for a film that was in Spanish, the lead was a Mexican woman that was undiscovered. I think she was in between jobs. Um, and it was in black and white, and it was on Netflix. And this movie completely defied every Hollywood studio rule, and it ended up capturing some of the top honors. And 
um, because he stuck to his vision of, of what he wanted to tell the story of uh, a Mexican woman. In this case, um, it was rep- representative of the maid that he had when he was a little boy in the 